people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. Let, let me uh, supplement the record briefly with respect to some objections that I have ruled on that I have not provided an explanation for. Uh, I have sustained some objections related to the childhood of some of the victims. Uh, based on some of the case law, um, I think that um, that is inadmissible victim impact evidence. Uh, and so I have sustained those. But I have drawn a difference between that kind of evidence and evidence related to a victim's background that is otherwise relevant. So for example, I have overruled objections related to um, a victim's earlier years and how that may have shaped him as a person at the time of the shooting and at the time of his death. Um, there was uh, some testimony just now from Mrs. Blunk about how her husband moved out of um, or, or was kicked out of uh, where he was living at the age of 15 and basically lived on his own and how that helped shape the person he became, this tough uh, person who over, uh, overcame a lot of uh, obstacles in life and how that helped make him the person that he became. So in that instance, I felt that was um, relevant and the testimony wasn't related to his um, childhood. It was, I think, in his uh, teenage years, I believe it was when he was 15. <clears throat> there was some testimony as well related to um, uh, provided by A.J. Boyk's mother uh, about how she raised him as a single mother uh, and how she became a single mom, I think, from the time when he was two years old. Uh, that testimony was relevant because it goes to the type of relationship that she had with him and and I felt that um, that's, um, she had a different type of relationship based on the fact that she was a, a single mother than she otherwise would have had and I thought that went to the type of relationship that she had with him and the impact of his um, the crimes on her. Uh, so I have made a, a couple of exceptions and, and by the way to the extent that I have allowed any testimony about that kind of um, evidence, it's been fairly brief. Uh, it hasn't been uh, testimony that has been um, lengthy or, or detailed. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that I have sustained some objections uh, at times when I felt like the witness had already answered the question and so I felt like it was becoming a narrative or I felt like um, the, the witness was now providing information that went beyond the scope of the question or perhaps had already provided sufficient information or an adequate amount of information, at least in my judgment, and that I felt that uh, there was a need to move on uh, because, of the, um, because the witness had already provided enough information on that subject matter. And, and again, that's pursuant to my uh, job in applying Rule 403. So, I wanted to supplement the record uh, with respect to some of those rulings. Are the parties ready for the jury? Mr. Brockler, are you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Ms. Brady, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's bring the jury in, please. I don't think so.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Welcome back, folks. Call your next witness, please, Mr. Brockler. Thank you, Your Honor. Sandy Phillips, please. Mrs. Phillips, good afternoon. Solemnly swore or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. Please be seated. Please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names. Sandra, S A N D R A, Anglin, A N G L I N, Phillips, P H I L L I P S. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'd like to publish previously admitted 4686. That request is granted. Ma'am. Who's this? It's my beautiful baby girl, Jessica Redfield Gowie. Thank you. How many kids do you have? Did you have? I had two um, Irish twins. My son is 16 months older than my daughter. Tell us about your son. What's his name? Jordan Gowie. When was he born? July 17, 1986. Your daughter, Jessica, did you call her that? I called her Jessie. When was she born? November 27, 1987. Is that Thanksgiving? It's always right around Thanksgiving, yes. Um, tell us about her name. How did you name her? My father's name was Jesse, and he wanted to have a granddaughter. So when I found out that I was having a girl, he was dying of cancer at the time. And so the last thing I could give him as a legacy was to name her after him. How about her middle name? What did you say it was? Nicole. Uh, she went by Redfield, but that's another story. Um, Nicole was her middle name, and uh, that was after her father, her biological father, whose name was Nick. Is that where the last name came from also, Gowie? Gowie, yes. And you said her father. Mm -hmm. How old was she when you two got divorced or stopped living? Four or five. 
And then did you end up raising her with her brother? Yes, I did. Now, you're married since? Yes. To a man named Lonnie? Yes. How long have you been married? We've been together for 22 years, going on 22 years. Was he a fixture in the home as you raised Jordan and Jesse also? Absolutely, yeah. For us to understand what has been taken and the impact on that, I need to ask you about your daughter. Tell us about her personality. She was a little whirlwind. Um, lots of energy, lots of um, graciousness. She was kind to others, always. She was always popular, always smart, always feisty. Um, very challenging as a parent, because uh, she was so smart. Uh, so she kept me on my toes. Hang on. Tell us about that. Give us an example of what you mean by that. Well, <clears throat> as girls become teenagers, uh, they can be a handful. And Jessie certainly was. And she would get very angry with us, and she'd go up to her room and slam her door. And uh, Lonnie told her, you know, if you slam your door again, we're going to take the door off the hinges. And she, of course, slammed the door again, and he went up with a hammer and chisel and took the, the door off. And uh, she got angrier and went up and slammed the bathroom door and lost the bathroom door, too. So... Awkward. <laughs> took three weeks for her to get him back, too. <laughs> so, but that's, you know, she challenged us all the time. And um, you couldn't help but be charmed by her. So it was very difficult to stay firm. To, to understand that, as you describe it, is that very different from your son? Oh, extremely, yes. Uh, we called Jessie Messy Jessie because she couldn't seem to clean her room and couldn't seem to find the closet for her clothes. And my son was just the opposite, extremely neat, tidy, orderly. Was she, the way you've described her, was she always, uh, if this is the wrong term, forgive me, strong-headed, strong-willed? Extremely so, yes. She knew when she made up her mind to do something, she would get it done. And we used to say that she was like a dog with a bone. When she got her teeth into something, you weren't going to change her way. Has she always been, and we know because we've seen the picture of her with the microphone, mm -hmm. and we've heard a little bit. She always been comfortable, performing may not be the right word either, but in that leadership out front sort of place? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, there was a time in nursery school that they were getting ready for their Christmas performance. Yeah, I'm object under 403 in due process and 401. Overrule. This is relevant because it goes to her personality. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. <clears throat> anyway, they were having a Christmas um, pageant, so to speak, and they had two songs that her class was supposed to sing. And they marched down the aisle and they sat down on the stairs of the, the altar. And the teacher was supposed to have them all stand up at one time and begin to sing. And the teacher went like this and she was the only one that stood up and proceeded to sing a solo. And um, when it was over, the church kind of erupted because it was pretty adorable, if I say so myself. And, um, we commented that she was like a little shooting star. You know, she just went out and did what she thought was right, and she kind of stole the show. She carried that with her till the end. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, I, I am going to want to talk to you about sort of where she was going with her life, mm -hmm. but first I want to ask you about her relationship with her brother. Mm-hmm kind of relationship could she have with him despite sort of these differences in personality? They were siblings. Um, there was certainly a rivalry. Um, he was the boy. She was the girl. Uh, they fought like cats and dogs, but they loved each other dearly. And um, my son has not done well since she was murdered. Where did you raise your family? Most of the time in San Antonio, Texas. Did, did they go to junior high, high school, all that together? Yes. Yeah. Well, what was your daughter's relationship like with Lonnie? Oh, uh, well, 
His most prized picture is a picture that he has of her sitting in his lap when she was five. And she's sound asleep on his shoulder, and he's sound asleep in the chair. And I took the picture, and um, it kind of expresses how they were with each other. There was a safety there that they both shared. Um, she loved him dearly. She called him Bubba, and he called her Babette. And she always knew when she was in trouble if he wasn't calling her Babette. If he referred to her by Jesse or Jessica, uh, she knew that she had done something pretty bad. Leading up to um, college and what brought her out here, and we'll talk about that, but what was your relationship like with your daughter? Mm. As a teenage girl, we were not close because I was the mom, and um, she would try to manipulate, and I wouldn't let her, and she didn't like that much. But I told her one time, I said, you know, I'm not supposed to be your friend right now, I'm your mother, but we'll be friends when you become an adult, and it had become that way. And uh, she used to tell her friends that I was her best friend. She planned two, at least two, surprise parties for my birthday um, and invited her friends to attend. So I was very blessed. We had a very, very lovely, loving relationship. What did, uh, what did Jessie tell you she wanted to be? she was growing up? Growing up, it was all over the place. Uh, she couldn't seem to find her niche, but she was always a very good writer, and um, that started to express itself in high school. And when she went off to college, she thought she wanted to go into psychology because she had a very big heart, and she wanted to help other people who were going through a difficult time. <clears throat> but after one semester of that, she realized, no, this isn't what I want to do, and came home and said, I want to go into sports broadcasting and journalism. And it was like, well, you know, that's what you want to do. Go do it. You're an excellent writer, so go make it happen. Look, to understand sort of her, um, I guess, the strong-willed nature and her initiative, what did she do to try to put herself in a position to achieve that? <laughs> well, again, dog with the bone. Uh, she got an internship at a local station in San Antonio, um, started networking very quickly, learned everything she could about hockey, um, and... Yeah, can I ask you something? Yes. Is this still in San Antonio? This is still in San Antonio. Hockey, I know. Hockey. <laughs> um, there was a, a team there uh, that fed into the National Hockey League uh, called the Rampage. And she, she um, got hooked. I mean, really got hooked. It was like, it was such a fast-paced game and not a lot of women in it. So she saw an opportunity and said, I love this sport. There aren't a lot of women in it. I can make room here. And did. And uh, how does that get her from San Antonio up here with us? She um, came to me at Christmas time in 2011, no, excuse me, 2010, and uh, brought a sports newscaster with her over to the house that we had met several times. And I went, okay, something's up. And she said, I'm not getting the kind of education that I really need at UTSA. I really want to go into broadcasting, and there's a school in Denver that can offer this for me. Plus, my friends who had already left San Antonio in the sports world had moved to Denver. And uh, they'll help me. They've already said they'll, they'll help me. So I knew I'd been had. And, um, and we came out here in that spring and met her friends, who were much older than she was. Jessie had friends of every age. You know, she was pretty um, unique in that regard. She had people that she was close to that were kids, I mean, two, three years old, all the way to senior citizens. Um, so she was unique in that regard. Um, where was I? I'm sorry. You were talking about the move up here, but let me ask a couple things just to make the record clear. Okay. 
you said she didn't feel like she was getting the education that she needed mm -hmm. at UTSA. Is that right. University of Texas, San Antonio? Yes, it is. Okay. And then uh, you said that she had found a school up here mm -hmm. that she thought was better suited to helping her advance her career. What was that school she ended up going to? Metro State. Metropolitan State. Mm -hmm. she, did you help her move up here? I did. When was that? It was the 4th of July weekend of 2011. And um, we had a road trip, just the girls, and brought her up here and helped her move in and paint her apartment and get her organized and get that messy closet uh, situated and uh, send her on her way. Do you remember where she was living? Yes, she was living in Capitol Hill at the time. In Denver? In Denver. Now at some point after she'd been living in Denver for a while, did she make the move to Aurora? Yes. Um, she was looking at her finances and realizing that she couldn't stay in the apartment in Capitol Hill by herself. Um, so she found a roommate and found the apartment, um, the Breakers, which is still in Denver, but it's on the borderline of Aurora, and um, moved in there the same weekend, 4th of July weekend. That same 4th of July weekend a year later? A year later, yeah. 2012. 2012. Is when she moved closer to Aurora. Right. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Ma'am, I'm going to hand you um, some pictures to help us have this conversation. Uh, this is People's Exhibit 4685, 4687, 4689, and 4688. Sorry about that being out of order. Would you take a look at those and tell me if you recognize all those photographs? Yes, sir, I do. Are those all pictures of your daughter? Yes, they are. Are they pictures of how she appeared close in time to when she was murdered? Yes, sir, they are. Do they capture different aspects of her life? Yes, they do. Here, I'm going to move for the admission of those four exhibits, 4685, 4687, 4688, and 46. 89, thank you, into evidence. Any objection? Nothing additional, Your Honor. All right, based on my previous rulings, uh, P-CR-4685 through 4689 inclusive are admitted and may be published. First thing I want to ask you about is 4685. What's going on in that photograph? She was in Turks and Caicos um, fishing, and um, she had landed that fish. And would you publish that for us? Pretty proud of that. Thank you. About 4687. <laughs> that was a Movember event um, in sports. Tell us what Movember is. <clears throat> in sports, November is uh, men's cancer awareness and uh, <clears throat> hence the mustache. And it became kind of a thing for her. In fact, there's one page on Facebook that's all about mustaches for Jesse. Um, yeah, became her signature, so to speak. Thank you. How about 4688? I was there when that picture was taken. Um, young man in school with her was studying photography and journalism and uh, asked if he could take a picture of, take a series of pictures for her. And she said, well, I could use some headshots anyway, so yes. And she told me that this guy was going to take pictures of her, and I said, not without me there. <laughs> I was like, uh-uh, not going to happen. And um, as he took that picture, I was standing behind him and said, oh my God, that's just the best picture ever. Thank you. 4689. The future. She was home visiting us um, when her former 
internship um, called her and said, you know, we can do that promo for you if you're interested. And uh, she hadn't brought any dress clothes, so uh, she had to be there within an hour. So we quickly ran over to Forever 21 and bought a basic black dress, and she wore my pearls and my earrings to, um, to do her promo. What was this picture going to be used for? To get her jobs. Thank you. And one thing that we cannot tell from those pictures is how she sounded in a better sense of her personality. I'd like to bless you. May I approach the witness, Your Honor, with People's Exhibit 1082? You may. And let me, let me correct my earlier ruling on the admissibility of the pictures. It's uh, P-TR-4685, 4687, 4688, and 4689. 4686 was not included, and so I misspoke. But the other ones, am I right about that? You are, but I believe, Your Honor, 4686 was the one originally admitted way back when. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's why it wasn't included in that last group. Okay, thank you. May I approach the witness? You may. Ma'am, I'm handing you a, a disc here. It's been marked as People's Exhibit 1082. Does that have your signature on it? Yes, it does. Tell us if you recognize it and what's on it. I do recognize it, and it's Jesse's very first interview um, on the ice. <clears throat> they hadn't bothered to tell her that it was going to be on the ice, and um, she showed up in high heels, and she falls a lot. D does this... This video that's on here, does that, in your opinion, fairly and accurately capture not only her manner of speech, but her, in certain regards, her personality and her sense of humor and the way she approached this career endeavor? Along with her tenacity, yes. You're not going to move for the admission of People's Exhibit 1082 into evidence. Is there any ob objection? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, based on my previous... Um, remarks and specifically my rulings in P dash TR dash or excuse me uh, C two oh four order C two oh four P dash TR dash ten eighty two is admitted and may be published. Man before we publish it, I want to set a little bit of the stage. You've talked about the ice already and the high heels. Mm -hmm. Your daughter appears to be interviewing somebody on this video. Yes. That somebody belongs to what? He's a hockey player that she had a bet with. Um, about a score, about somebody winning, and he lost and had to wear her Michigan t-shirt. Is that why it is so ridiculously small on him? Yes, okay. <laughs> yes. And uh, he also had to sing a Justin Bieber song. I don't think we'll get to that part no. right there, but is that what's on this video here that we're going to see? Yes. Ma'am, would you please publish 1-0 you if you want to. Um, I think I'm going to host the interview, pal. Ask me about the dip. Yeah, that's that's my first question. What happened? Is it a zit? If it's a zit, I'm going to no, be really embarrassed. It's, it looks like you got hit with the puck. Actually, uh, he who shall not be named when I was little uh, came in and cast some spell on me, so every time he comes around, it lights up and it hurts a lot. Okay. Um, so Friday, y'all are playing the Texas Stars, and... Y'all struggle As a them. professional, you need to ignore anything that goes on. If there's a bomb that goes off, you gotta... And you should probably face the camera a little bit. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> or not pull. Can we please sit? Can we Here at 760 WKR. <laughs> Come on, let's go! <laughs> Can we please sit? Now I'm not nearly as embarrassed no. as I want to be. So you've done this for how many days? How many days have you been an like, intern? Uh, this is the first time they've ever been It makes you feel better at the NHL ring service. Why don't you talk into the microphone, for Yeah. Yeah. You're nailing it. I'm telling you. I know. I'm doing such a great job. This is full of fail. Okay, y'all struggled with Tex uh, the Texas Stars. What's that been about? Uh, you know, we were on, on a pretty high streak. We had seven, uh, six or seven games in a row. Okay. Um, and what about players coming in and out throughout the entire season? You get guys that come down from the NHL. Um, you have guys that are coming in from the, um, from the Coyotes. How does that change the dynamic of the team? Uh, a little bit. What are your thoughts on Canada? 
Personally, I think it's uh, it's a sub-state to the United States. Uh, but going to school in Michigan, you're able to go up to Canada and start drinking a little bit younger. Right? No, actually, uh, at school, at an elite at an elite school like such as Michigan, we don't uh, consume alcohol. We try to put our bodies in the best position possible to uh, perform at the uh, the intensity and the level that we need to uh, perform at. So, November's over. Why do you still have it? Uh, Does actually, it have a name? because what's that? Does it have a name? Uh, it doesn't have a name. Um, it's actually a girl, so I don't really appreciate you saying he. Um, but no, it doesn't have a name. Um, but it does have a mind of its own. Um, every now and then it'll tell me different things. It's, it's not really a whisper, more of a, like it'll itch. Certain spots on my face will itch, and then I know if, you know, yes, no, don't buy it, buy it. Um, uh, you know, take a nap, eat this, eat that. So, you know, it's definitely, uh, she's definitely helped me out here in the last uh, last few months and uh, making just small life decisions. What's she, say, what's she saying about uh, the outfit you're wearing right now? Well, I think the outfit's uh, definitely fitting. I think uh, I got this at Victoria's Secret. They were having their semi-annual sale the other day, so uh, definitely got in, got the, uh, the blackout, the Black Friday specials. So it was good. It was a steal, actually. It good. was a steal. Good. Well, I think it's time for you to pay off your bet. All right, let's do it, Justin Bieber. I love you. Is that the point where he ends up singing, Justin Bieber? And he does it very well. <laughs> now, uh, did your daughter end up uh, improving in her interview <laughs> skills after that? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> she actually called me after that interview crying um, and said, my career's ruined before it even begins because she fall, she fell down probably five to seven times during the, the interview. <clears throat> but what actually happened was when it got posted, um, she ended up getting lots of phone calls because of it, because she was so tenacious and stayed after it and regained her composure and continued on. When she was up here going to Metro State, did she also um, have internships with mm -hmm. different sports outlets, media outlets? Yeah, she had a internship with Altitude Sports and with 104.3 covering the Avs and uh, was supposed to interview the next day on the 21st with Mile High Sports for her first broadcasting job. Did, uh, did she have a boyfriend? Yes. And what was his name? Jay. Had you had an opportunity to meet Jay? Mm-hmm. Is that yes? I'm yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, we um, did. When and where was that? I'm going to object at this point, 403, 401, due process. I think this is outside the scope of victim impact. Overruled. Go, go ahead, ma'am. Um, she had brought him home during spring break, April. Of 2012. 2012. So he could meet us and um, experience San Antonio during Fiesta, which is a big event that they have there. It lasts for 17 days, and there's lots to see and do. And um, she wanted him to meet her friends and get the stamp of approval. Did he? Oh, yeah. Now, look, she has a, a best friend mm -hmm. that ended up traveling up here, and we'll talk about that. For, it leads to this night. But who was her best buddy? Brent Lowack. And did Brent come up here prior to July the 20th, 2012? Yes, he helped move her in. When she and I drove up, he came up a couple of days later with all of her stuff and uh, helped move her in. And that was into the breakers in 2012? No. This was the earlier one? Right. Did he come back out in July of 2012? Yes, he had a ticket that he was going to use in 2011 with Southwest. Uh, that had to be used within a year's time. So he was he flew out um, to use that ticket and spend some time with her. And I almost changed my flight to be here as well. What we don't know yet is what you mean by that. Had you made plans to come out here shortly after July the 20th? I was supposed to be out there the f here, excuse me, the following Tuesday. Why? Just to help her settle into the new place and get her ready for school and bring money. Now, did you become aware on the 19th, 20th, that night, early morning time, that your daughter had gone to the movies with Brent? 
Yes, I woke up um, one o'clock Texas time, actually about a quarter of one Texas time, and uh, felt really like I had slept all night for some reason, and got up and went out into the living room and thought, well, I'll just text to see if they're still up, and they were, and she told me that they were at the movies, and I said, I'll let you go, we'll talk in the morning, and she said, Mom, go back to bed, get some sleep, I can't wait to see you next week, I need my mama, and I responded, I need my baby girl. And that was the last time we said anything to each other. Over text. You remember after that. Did you go back to sleep? No. You remember being told later about the shooting and about your daughter? I got a phone call about 25 minutes later from Brent inside the theater. And I remember looking down at it and thinking, it's odd that Brent's calling me. Why isn't Jesse? But I took the call and I said, hey baby, what's up? And I could hear the screaming in the background going on. <clears throat> Was he able to tell you what had happened? I said, what's going on? And he said, there's been a shooting. And I said, are you okay? And he said, I think I've been shot twice. And as he's telling me this, I'm realizing that Tessie isn't on the phone. And I asked him where she was. <laughs> I said, where's Jesse? And he said, I tried. And I said, Brent, tell me she's okay. And he said, I tried. And I said, oh God, Brent, please tell me she's not dead. And I started screaming. And my husband ran out of the bedroom. And this guttural sound was coming out of me. That and he caught me as I was sliding down to the floor. And um, I called my son. I remember calling my son and uh, telling him that Brad had called and that I thought his sister was dead. And my son is also a paramedic and a fireman, as in Brent, as is Brent. And uh, he came over, and I don't remember how long it took him to get to the house, but... And when he got there, he called Brent again, and Brent had, by that point, been taken to the hospital. And um, my son stepped outside and talked with him. Your Honor, if we may uh, interrupt just briefly and approach, please. Yes.
All right, the objection is overruled. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Um, Ma'am, after you found out about your daughter's murder, did you make plans to have memorial services for her? Yes, we did. Did you move her back down home to San Antonio? Uh, she was cremated um, and brought home. And we were planning on a very small service. And my son called me from Denver and said, Mom, you're going to need one of the mega churches. And we had over 2,000 people showed up. How many of them were from even up here or from places that she'd worked with up here? Coast to coast, all the way from Canada, New York, Florida, California. The president of the AVS came, flew in. Where she'd interned at altitude. In fact, they have a, at the desk, the media desks that they have, um, they have a little plaque there dedicated to her. Um, you had touched on this earlier, but I, I want to give you a chance to tell us in full. How is her brother as a result of the loss of his sister? He hasn't dealt with it. As I said, he's a firefighter and a paramedic, so he's very stoic. Um, he doesn't visit much. Um, he's, he's texting more than he used to. Um, it's hurt the family. What about Lonnie? Do you notice any differences in your husband? Mm -hmm. He's my rock. He takes care of me because I'm not the same person that I used to be. I want to talk a little bit about how your daughter's murder has impacted your life at home with some specific examples. Thanksgiving. Jesse's birthday was always on or around Thanksgiving. So now we leave the country where they don't celebrate Thanksgiving and um, try to forget what's going on. Is the last Thanksgiving that you celebrated in 2011? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. How about um, movies? Can't go to movies. Um, can't even go to indoor venues that have theater seats. In fact, when we first came into the courtroom, when we visited the first time, I had to um, steel myself against the fear um, can't stand the smell of popcorn. It makes me gag. Was it, were these all things that have changed with you since your daughter's murder? Yes. Did you used to do something special on Christmas? <coughs> Both children um, every year would get an ornament um, for the tree from the time they were born until 2011. Um, the last ornament that I gave Jesse was of a hockey player. Um, in fact, we weren't even going to put a tree up that year, and she said, but I'm coming home, and you have to have a tree up. And I didn't really feel like doing it, but I thought, you know, she's getting older, and we'll have her own traditions soon. So I'll put the tree up. And after that Christmas, I took the ornaments down, and put her ornaments in a separate box and Jordan's ornaments in a separate box so I could give them to them the following Christmas and say, you're now adults and um, here's your tradition to start with. Yeah, do you guys even celebrate Christmas anymore? No. In fact, in 2012, I gave her ornaments to Brent and his girlfriend, who is Jesse's best friend, Bridget. And um, they put the tree up and they always take a picture and send it to me. Ma'am, I've asked about your son and I've asked about your husband. 
Tell us how you are different since the murder of your daughter. I have PTSD. My brain is mush. I can't retain things like I used to. I'm not as organized as I used to be. Um, I cry every day, still. Probably always will. My husband, um, my husband is everything. And um, between the two of us, we hold on. We redefine ourselves. We live very much in the moment. Um, obviously, we're both older. My husband's 71, I'm 65. So um, we don't plan on a future anymore. It may sound ridiculous to ask you to do this in a sentence, but if you had to tell the jury the thing or things that you missed most, that you miss most about your daughter now that she's gone, what would you say? The constant text messages that she'd send. Um, her sending pictures of trying on clothes and if I approved of this or that. Um, her tweets. She was very funny. Very funny. Most of all, just her love. Just her love. And the way she loved her friends, the way she loved her family. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, I have, I have nothing further. Do you have any questions, Ms. Higgs? Yes, sir, I do not. All right, and the jury does not appear to have any questions. May Mrs. Phillips be released from her subpoena? Yes. Is there any objection? Oh, no, sir. All right, Mrs. Phillips, thank you. Thank you. All right, members of the jury, it's uh, about seven minutes until five, so we're going to go ahead and adjourn for the day. I want to remind you that you may not be swayed by emotion. Your decisions in this sentencing hearing may not be the result of any irrational or arbitrary emotional response. Rather, each of your final sentencing verdicts must reflect your individual reason moral judgment. Please keep in mind all of my advisements. Uh, they apply overnight, as they do every night, um, so make sure that you follow each and every one of them. Uh, I'm anticipating that I'm going to have this case to you uh, no later than next week, so we're almost there, but it is extremely important that you continue to follow all of my advisements. Does everyone understand that? And everyone's saying yes and nodding their head yes, or mostly nodding their head yes. All right. Get some rest tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow morning at the usual time, 8.40. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. <clears throat> the records reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Is there anything we need to talk about at this time on behalf of the prosecution? Mr. Brockler. Your Honor, in terms of uh, scheduling, I know what the court had just advised the jury. I, I think that logistically we are set to likely wrap up tomorrow and if we're able to do that in the early afternoon given the fact that the court has provided uh, draft instructions uh, perhaps we could think in terms of and maybe we could solidify this at noon tomorrow but uh, think in terms of scheduling an instructions type conference for the end of today or tomorrow in anticipation of closing on Thursday depending upon what evidence the defense may seek to uh, to put on 
And, and that's why I said at the latest next week, because I, I don't know whether the defense is going to have any evidence or not. If the defense does, then that could change things. And if the defense presents evidence, you may want to present rebuttal evidence. The statute says that I can allow any evidence that I find is relevant uh, as long as each party has an opportunity to rebut it. So um, for that reason, I said next week. Uh, if you think that you will uh, finish with your evidence early tomorrow, then I would very much be in favor of uh, doing some work at some point um, if the defense is not ready to proceed with evidence tomorrow or if defense doesn't have any evidence. And whether that's talking about instructions or doing the Curtis advisement and the advisement on uh, the right to make a, a statement in allocution or all three, uh, remains to be, uh, or depends on how long the prosecution tends to moral and whether the defense wants to present any evidence or not. You know, I, I don't think we're going to present evidence. If the court will just give us till tomorrow morning, uh, we'll let the court know for sure. But for scheduling purposes right now, I think it makes sense to assume if they finish tomorrow, we don't present any evidence. The court can do Curtis advisement, the allocution advisement, and we can start discussing at what point is best time to discuss instructions and I agree closing probably on Thursday. Okay and maybe what we could do is uh, uh, schedule the closings uh, um, a little bit late Thursday to give us a chance to finalize instructions if we need to. I, I also don't know if there are going to be any uh, PowerPoint presentations that the parties are going to want to use and if there are going to be objections then I'm going to have to schedule some time for that so um, we'll just see where we are tomorrow but I appreciate um, you giving me a heads up on that. Ms. Brady. I have uh, the, pow the slides that I used during my closing from phase two. Are we at 118 for court exhibits? I'll mark that as C-TR-118 and give that to the court. Great, thank you. Mr. Brockler, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about today? No, sir, thank you. All right, Ms. Brady, do you have anything? No, sir. No, okay. I'll see everyone tomorrow morning then at the usual time, 8.40. The court will be in recess. Thank you, everyone.